thanks so much again for joining us. Um, I was wondering if you could first talk about, and Gavin, you may be biased on this question, but I'm wondering if you can tell us about some of the hardware and software technologies that you're most excited about right now in terms of IoT and sustainability. It's, it's for all of you. <laughs> so I, I think the biggest challenge now is, you know, is, is, is integrating things into usable services. Uh, whatever the technology, it's just this disparity in technology and services uh, that are out there. For example, we all know our commute back home will be bad, right? How bad? Can we measure that? Technology is out there, but bringing it to us as customers is, is, is quite difficult. If you look at you know, some companies that give you these travel directions, the uncertainty in the, in the, in the commute is still huge. There. Your travel time back home will be plus minus one hour if you do request at Google Maps right now. They don't know. Um, why? That's a good question. Maybe it's not integrated well enough. Maybe they don't measure things precisely enough. I don't know. You know, I, I see a couple of interesting technology and software innovations. Um, you know, not surprising, uh, a few of those we're working on at Microsoft. Um, one is some of the augmented reality um, devices. Uh, we have a product called HoloLens uh, that is allowing people inside of a building, for example, to overlay what might be a blueprint uh, or the, the schema for a building with the physical architecture of that building to be able to see effectively behind the walls. And this is about bringing those sensor networks to life in a way that integrates with the physical uh, uh, embodiment of that building to be able to you know, guide someone through a fix or identify um, you know, a wall that's not there or a broken pipe, et cetera. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And then I think on the software side, uh, machine learning, uh, as Tom said earlier, has tremendous potential to not only act retroactively or historically on data, uh, but to really anticipate what's coming. And so in the building space, you know, we're, we're harvesting data in a way that allows us to anticipate when different things within the building will break um, and address those ahead of time so that we're not you know, rolling trucks or, or dealing with a situation where the, product, the problem is now exponentially uh, older and uh, costing us more money. Uh, I, I would just uh, build on that by saying one of the things I, I think is, is very interesting is, is advances in presence detection that uh, may just emerge from, say, devices. So devices broadcast you know, the MAC address, and they, they, they broadcast other information that really can be used in sort of a, a de-identified way to sort of determine um, where massive movements are. And they can see that in the context of vehicle movements. You can see that in the context of, 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 uh, of people movements and also, also in parking applications. Um, you know, what a lot of these applications um, uh, need to do is to find ways in which existing infrastructure uh, of information is already being transmitted and to harness that um, to provide cost-effective solutions. There's, there's some degree to which, you know, physical infrastructure needs to be built out. There's no doubt about that. But at some point, the value of that information um, uh, is exceeded by the capital cost of that infrastructure or the, the capital cost of its maintenance. And so finding cost-effective ways for for detecting the presence of, of, of people and of, of vehicles, I think is, is uh, one of the most exciting applications that's emerging. I'd agree very much with the theme that integration is what is sort of missing. If I think about the technologies that excite me right now, green button data is a really good example. It's now possible to get massively more accurate information about how much electricity a person used and when for essentially anyone in the US. And then if you look at all the companies that are actually trying to build equipment on this, a lot of them are saying they've been having trouble combining the various different technologies that have come along. Same thing happening on a lot of uh, home uh, applications for IoT. We see a lot of different companies with their own hub that actually doesn't play nicely with the hub from other companies. And we're seeing a lot of folks have to decide, all right, do I want to have an Apple home or do I want to have a Nest home? And so I think uh, a lot of the technologies that are exciting right now are sort of building blocks and um, not necessarily integrations of those systems. I don't think that there's necessarily a holistic approach on any of these things. You know, you just brought up the aspect of the home. What happens with all of the home automation and IoT systems that you've put into your home when you sell it? Do you sell a, a platform and system with it? it? You know, you always assume when you buy a new home, you're getting all the keys. 
but with all of the IoT devices, what's the control of it and where is it living and is that control being turned over to the new owner? Is, is it um, cable companies that could own this? Is it um, telecommunications providers? Who would be the owner of an actual home IoT system? And, and that's a w one way to be thinking about this. Um, you know, I get very concerned about the the, the, the tips, the trust, identity, protection, uh, privacy, safety, and security, and it's really of everything, the whole device, data, and people. So uh, Emily brings up a related point um, that Tom brought up in his address in terms of eightfold increases in the generation of data. What are some of the challenges for data management in IoT, and how can we respond to them? And I know, Emily, you have a lot to say on the topic, but I invite everybody to respond. Would you like for me to start? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that while there are a lot of different silos of data, and you know, Tom definitely demonstrated that with all of the work that he's doing with his company, um, but it's really when you get the triangulation of all the different data points that you're able to extract the really interesting insights and the actionable intelligence uh, to go to work in a smart city or a smart campus or even a smart building environment. It, it is the triangulation of all that data. However, comma, it needs to be protected. It needs to be, you need to have the right people gaining access to the data, uh, knowing that the data is true in form from its actual generation, and, and how is it being stored and harvested going forward. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier today about how um, things are going to be used 10 years down the road. Uh, you know, the data that my Fitbit is generating about me today is fine and dandy, but what happens later down the road when perhaps that data is then integrated with my healthcare records, et cetera? So I, I can add to that, to that and, and that I think in some applications, um, you know, we, we may be learning sort of what is the right resolution of data to make the decisions that we're interested in making. So um, you know, the, the, the ASF Park case is a good example where uh, those sensors were producing second by second occupancy information and, and that information produced you know, uh, terabytes and, and, and petabytes of data. Um, but ultimately, that information really needed to be just rolled up in order for them to make appropriate decisions. And, and what actually happened in that case was that you had sensing sensors going down. And so the resolution of that information started to uh, get worse at a very, very highly precise level. Um, but there was still ways in which that information at a much more manageable scale could be used for the appropriate decisions. And so I think in some applications, you know, we think of, of just generating data for every single second and every single every, every single point in time and, and eventually we may learn that you know we don't need that for all these applications that for some we only need a certain higher level of aggregation and so that would be one way in terms of managing it be like sort of data demand management I guess you might say um, that uh, that we'll learn and I don't think we can we can know that until we sort of go uh, to, to full resolution of information and then we can roll it back a little bit once we realize, hey, you know, that level of precision just isn't necessary all the time. Alexi, I'm wondering if you'd like to comment on this given that you deal with location information, um, which has important privacy implications. Well, I'm not sure I could, uh, you know, say something reasonable on privacy. It's, uh, it's a much longer conversation, so I would like not to do that in, in a minute. Uh, but in a minute, what I would like to say is what Anna is saying. You know, you don't need to store all the data. You should re be able to replace data with models that provide you actionable insights. You don't need to store temperatures all over US in, in gigabytes of data. Store a couple of points, build a good model that predicts temperatures everywhere, you're done. No need of storing this. Don't, layers. don't those models uh, presume that they're pulling data from some source? It yeah. lives somewhere, right? Absolutely. So there are compromises of how much you need to store, how much you need to use for training, how much you need is enough for you to right. produce uh, accurate predictions. And those compromises are not being explored yet. Yeah. I think in particular they've been explored even a little bit for accuracy and very little for impact. Mm -hmm. One thing we're seeing is a lot of companies have thought accurately through as my results 95% accurate or 99% accurate and have not really thought through is this achieving the maximum benefit I can get per dollar for the thing I'm trying to do. We're seeing a lot of smart data scientists sort of save all the data because they like accuracy rather than having a business perspective on what can I do with it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Alexi, you and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the sustainability benefits of self-driving cars. And you mentioned that the sustainability benefits are really only realizable if people give up private car ownership. So let's talk about what kinds of conditions and changes are necessary for the successful adoption of the kinds of technologies we're discussing and for the yield of the kind of sustainability benefits that we'd like to see. Well, I think it's a more of a social science problem. Uh, it's it changing the mentality from you know, ownership to access that is the thing we need to to solve here. Because self-driving cars can, you know, things can go both ways. In the moment you own self-driving cars, you might just start sending it uh, for all the little errands that you would not be driving yourself. Just to just its convenience, it will generate lots of travel that's absolutely unnecessary. Um, so it has to be a shared car, where you pay for necessity of service and then the algorithm optimizes the use of that resource. Uh, that way, it's kind of, you know, you can moderate this, this unnecessary use and re reduce the impact. Uh, and tra transition to, you know, to, to, to this state is, 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 again, it's a mentality uh, problem rather than anything else. I, I, and I can build on, on, on Alexi's comments related to existing shared mobility systems. Uh, you know, we do see today car sharing, bike sharing systems, and, and ride sourcing like Lyft and Uber. Um, that are making impacts in terms of how people are, are, are traveling. And in some ways, these, these systems are operating just as automated cars would today, but with the driver, you know, not automated. So their behavioral impact, uh, I think, will evolve over time. We do see um, in, in, in survey data that people get rid of cars because of car sharing. And they even get rid of cars because of, because of bike sharing. And more importantly, the larger impact that we are seeing is the suppression effect, is that people will grow into these systems. They won't be plop down on an existing urban environment under a pre-existing paradigm, they will, people will grow into that system and then they will never get a car. And so you'll never see that car actually removed. Um, and you'll have a much higher population with, uh, with, uh, with lower vehicle ownership as the projected trend. I think that the, the, the success in many ways, though, is dependent on you know, how, how do we bust down the silos, which was a, a conversation from earlier. Um, across the different tr modes of transportation that people depend on today, you know, so it's not just about, you know, will autonomous vehicles replace single occupancy vehicles, it's about how do you provide um, citizens with access to a range of options to, to get from point A to point B and have those integrated into what makes the most sense for that person at that time in the city that he's living or, or working in uh, or she. And so, you know, I think those barriers still exist today. I mean, today for you to, for any of us to get from point A to point B, you know, we're going for three or four different apps. You know, we may be looking at, you know, physical objects to, to, to gauge where and how we navigate. Uh, it's really hard. I think we would all agree. Yeah, I and mean, just to pick up on the conversation earlier about the commute that you brought up, you know, just think about a single app that managed your entire commute of, you know, from the second you walk out to the, the door to what, all, from door to door of which bus do I take, where, you know, is it encountering any difficulties uh, if I take this train line as opposed to that train line because this, the first train line is encountering signal problems or, and then I have to drive the last, you know, 15 minutes of the commute where are the potholes, where the water main breaks, where, you know, in a completely real-time integrated application to show you the whole spectrum of options to your point and the ways to do it. I think that really hits a common problem that we're seeing that a lot of these applications require so much capital, of course, mm -hmm. that you are always talking about uh, comp uh, corporations trying to compete with another. Right. And yet a lot of the benefits to these networks are from cooperation. And so I think <coughs> we're seeing some really interesting examples of, I guess it was called co-opetition, um, where companies are both helping each other out at the same time that they're trying to compete for sales. Uh, and I think that's really where a lot of the barriers are right now, is finding business models that allow competitors to collaborate and share data in ways that work out for both of them. I was just going to say that, I mean, I think that's what makes um, these, these projects, like smart city projects, so compelling, because they are melting pots. You know, they, they are a venue in which to be successful, you have to be able to work together. And that's working together, not with other private sector companies, but also public sector companies, nonprofits, academics. Uh, and that's really where we see a lot of success in, in sort of 
getting the outcomes we're looking for is by you know forging those partnerships together. So I have a couple of more questions, but I see we're almost at the end of our panel, and I wanted to open up um, to questions from the audience. Um, and I believe, does anyone have a card that they'd like to share with Brandy? You want her <laughs> <laughs> And your mother's maiden name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody has used the word interoperability or anything similar to it, but I hear in IoT companies a worry that their customers are worried about this. Not necessarily the IoT uh, focused companies themselves, but their customers worry about interoperability. Um, it's a big topic, so you can't say much in a minute, but go for it. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I was impressed by is uh, PG&E. So often we've heard it's increasingly not just customers, but uh, groups looking out for those customers that ensure interoperability. So we were told if our systems are not interoperable, we are not compatible with PG&E demand response programs. I was very impressed by that, because as a consumer, you don't want to be going around having to ensure this yourself. And so having third parties uh, take on that role of ensuring that, I thought was very effective. I mean, I think Microsoft has uh, come to terms with the fact that for us to be competitive uh, and to grow, we need to be interoperable. And you know, you increasingly see our technologies integrated with, you know, the uh, iOS platforms and uh, the you know, the other ones that are out there. So it's it's really Im important for us to be able to drive that sense of interoperability. Um, for not only our own company, but for the end consumer to have a, a seamless experience across all of these. I think in transportation it's always been a, a challenge. Um, and in transportation you have people interfacing with different systems and generally paying for those systems in different ways. And so, um, you know, there are apps now that provide information on how to get from one place to another using um, multimodal information, and so I think that there are applications, at least, that are being built overlaid on the transportation system that uh, that are trying to address this problem. Um, whether systems such as you know bike sharing, car sharing, and, uh, and others can and and ride sourcing can interface with each other directly, I think that's something that's that's still an open question. Other questions in the back. Um, Sorry, so far we have just talked about data and the sensor, and if we have uh, more measurements, then we could we, we could do more. But um, my question is that what is the role of sort of control and management algorithms that are capable of incorporating all that data that are coming from measurements or sensors? Are we capable enough in terms of management and control of the data that we gather from the sensors? So here, here it's useful to focus on control over what kind of system you're talking about. Control over infrastructure that actually got actuators is, is one problem. Control over populations where you want to change lifestyles is a totally different problem. Um, and the first one is okay. The second one is just uh, we haven't started yet. I, I, do, I do think that you know, the data is only as interesting as the questions that are asked um, and, and that the data will answer. You know, so certainly, um, analytics and the, the, t the type of tools that help you visualize those answers in ways that are actionable and mean something are, uh, are certainly, th those tools are out there, um, but increasingly, you know, for us to be able to do something with that data, it needs to be presentable. It needs to be in a format and an and answer to a question that we are looking for. I think we see something interesting with interoperability of control. Um, if you go to a UC Berkeley professor and you say, I have 16 different questions, what control system should I use? They can almost always give you a generic system that's useful for many different things if you just tweak it. Uh, most of the IoT companies, when we've actually looked at their code, to our surprise, they really don't think like that. Most of them have custom built a particular application which is not easily customizable, which was surprising to us because it's often not actually harder to use a generic system. Um, and so we've noticed a real disconnect between what is being studied uh, at elite universities and what's being implemented in code specifically around control. Do we have any more questions? One more. Yeah, I'm kind of curious what your ideas are about uh, citizen science and making wiser consumers. Because uh, we seem to be exploited, particularly our children, and uh, we're kind of ignorant of the impact. 
And so this whole theme about the Internet of Things and sustainability, I think, should be focused on citizen science engaging and understanding their environment and not being exploited for the dollar. What's your thoughts? Well, that's a rather open-ended question. <laughs> Would you like to respond? Well, I think that a lot of what we're talking about can even become true reality without understanding within the citizens of what all of this is and what it means for them, how it could improve their life. So a lot of it's from an, an education standpoint of a grassroots effort. I'll just say, I think that citizen science is enabled by, by open data and, and the open data applications that have been, have been uh, projected by, by some systems. And I think uh, bike sharing systems are a good example of, of systems that really just broadcasted their data. They don't really compete directly across uh, different cities. And, and some of the best visualizations, really, uh, of, of, those, um, of, that, of those data have been produced by just sort of people working on, on those, those, just that data and then and sort of an independent sort of as a, as a hobby. And that has enabled us to give better information on how people move through the cities. And it's not necessarily a research project, it was just a competition. Um, so there is a, I think, a precursor to, to, to engaging citizen science. And uh, NASA has done a couple of things like this where it's allowing people to have the resources to, to engage with that analysis. And I think that's um, an industry choice that varies across the spectrum of different technologies. And uh, I would like to share a vision of what we're doing about it, because we know this is a problem, right? The, the, your question, it got real, real, uh, it's real deep. So I will mention one thing that is happening now. There's a smart city challenge, the DOT smart city challenge. They want to transform US cities. They want to start with one. San Francisco is a finalist, and there's a vision that is going to be implemented if we win. And um, the vision, one ambition there is that, you know, all these beautiful platforms, very complicated and expensive platforms, will need to be applied to cities. But the outcomes of that analytics have to be presented not just to city managers, but to every citizen in a way that you could optimize your own life and contribute to some you know, improvement to, to the life of the city in, 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 in a way that is transparent to everybody. You know, the information has to be shared, uh, the same information has to be shared to, to everybody. And uh, Berkeley is doing something about it. There's a big data science program in Berkeley where most of the courses are open and you know, you could, you could, you could transform education so that the outputs of this analytics enabled by IoT, uh, IoT would be understandable for, for everybody. And that will be a massive change. And that will change the mentality too. You, will, you know, the, the moment you understand your own impact to, to environment and your own contribution to emissions, it will change things. Yeah, I, I agree. What you're I think there's really something to that also just in the face of the increasing complexity of these systems. It is, we've now reached a point where no one citizen really can understand all of this. Uh, and in order to work, these functions have to be so complicated that I think we're seeing a move from uh, an individual smart person can learn everything there is to know to, to just a real role for trust uh, and collective intelligence, where it's just too much for any one person to process. And so there's a real need for respected citizen science voices to be looking at sort of independent third parties and interpreting for others what's going on in a more manageable way than knowing every detail that's happening in the system. On that note, um, I'd like to thank our panel. Mm -hmm.